We need some music, Mark. Can you grab your guitar and? Unfortunately, I don't have one here in my office. I need to do that though. Hmm. I think uh, we can. Let's see if we can, how many people do we have in the room now? We've got quite a few, I think. Yes. I see Mylene and David Press, Ryan, Jim Brown. Uh, Mark, Jim Brown's probably going to be thinking of a difficult question that he could ask. I, I, I'm not sure. Is he still up in Alaska or is he back home now? I don't know. Zoom reaches all the way to Alaska. Hello, Rory. Hey, how, how are, are you? you? Rory, how are you doing tonight? I am well, thank you. Good to see you all. I think, um, Mark Bond, do we have to unmute, unmute people to that's let a them very, speak? That's or? a very good question. I, can you guys unmute yourselves? I guess Rory was able to. Um, yeah. Yes. We're filling up fast. Yeah, we can unmute ourselves. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hi, John. Hey, Don Klinger, hello, yeah. welcome. David Prest, I haven't seen you in a long time. It's uh, it's good to see your name on the list here. Trying to oh, hello, figure out how we can get people to talk. David Prest, there he is. Good to see everyone. Good to connect with you. I know you some of, some of you are trying time. to talk to me and I can't hear. It may be because we have... Uh, we're going to have to hit something. We'll have to find something to allow you to speak. This would be a great meeting. We, and we invite you to come and share a discussion with us, and then we don't give anybody the ability to talk. So, <laughs> Hey, John, can you hear me? I, th I think John's the problem. I think everybody else is okay, right? Everybody yeah. can hear me? Yep. I can hear you, Bill. Hey, Mark, do you want to text yes. John and tell him? Yeah, let I me think do that. No, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. But you, you're, uh, we need to get a message to him. His, his speakers are not working or something. Yeah, let me try to text him real quick here. In fact, I'll just text him from my phone. Um, Good evening, Julie. Good to see you, too. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Julie. Larry Blackmere, how you been? I haven't seen you forever. I know. How are you, John? I'm afraid John still can't hear. Yeah. He might try to get to uh, disconnect and reconnect. Uh, Mark, I cannot hear you guys, and that's it. Might be me. Um, Let's see where my audio is. I just texted him that he might try disconnecting and reconnecting, um, or just change his speaker output to something different that should work as well. Yeah, I, th I think I, I can hear you now. I think I've got. Uh. Yeah, yeah, that was me, and I'm sorry, well, Mark. Welcome back, John. Yeah, I was out there for a while, wasn't I? We could hear you, but we we're certain you couldn't hear us. So, yeah, yeah. Where's my picture? No. Okay. Well, it is now six o'clock. We have uh, 67 people on board here. So this, this is great. This is pretty awesome. Let's see. So I think we're ready to get started.
All right. Well, hey, good evening, everybody. And um, just so you, uh, everyone's at the right meeting, this is the, the pre-session, the, the meeting before session, which is just two weeks away right now, the delegate information meeting. Uh, just to let you know, we're not voting on anything tonight, okay, because this is information that we're giving to you. The committees have already done their work. What we're wanting to do is uh, help you to know what's coming up. Um, our North Pacific Union constituency session does not have uh, a lot of time. I mean, we have three hours in the morning to cover everything we need to do. And in the afternoon is the university. And uh, so we're gonna be running pretty quick through everything. And you know that you've been to, most of you have been to a, a constituency session before. So what we thought is this time with uh, how great we are with Zoom, everyone seems to be experts at that right now because of the pandemic, we've all been using it and uh, that we do some type of uh, information meeting for you in case there's any questions and then you can, um, um, you can ask, that, uh, ask those uh, questions here tonight. So um, <clears throat> what we're doing tonight, there's several things that's on the agenda. One, I have a few remarks that I'll go over, not very, very long at all. Um, we have a financial report and it's more information on how all the uh, work for the uh, finance, finances are done, what the finance department does and all the auditing and everything that goes on so that you've got uh, some understanding of actually how that work is being done. And then um, proposed changes to the bylaws um, that Bill is going to do. Mark takes you through the finances, Bill, the uh, proposed changes to the bylaws. Now, those bylaw changes will go through what they are. Again, we're not voting on them. They've come through the committee. And so they're going to come to us through to the session. What we're hoping to do tonight is just help give you some explanation on uh, why they're there, if you have any questions about some of the wording on it, if you have any questions. And so as we go through this tonight, um, I'm not sure how, how, how good it's gonna be because we're gonna have to keep flipping back and forth between screens. Um, but if you have, if you raise your hand, it'll put you, uh, in fact, if you go to the, um, <clears throat> the reactions, and I know you've all been through this, but if you have, if you go to the reactions and you raise your hand, um, then um, we'll catch it because that puts you right up at the uh, front of the of the line. And then um, if you because if you have a question, we want you to ask it uh, right away. And uh, so we don't have to flip uh, slides going back. And then you just push it to lower it after you're done. And um, and I think we're, we're we're pretty good. So let me have a. a, a a uh, word of prayer here as we get uh, started here tonight. And again, welcome everybody. It's good to see all these faces from all over our union. And um, so let's, uh, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we are uh, very grateful again uh, tonight to be here in your presence. And uh, Lord, to have some time together as a uh, uh, NPUC family from all over the uh, union, uh, taking a look at some questions or, or some things, how we do our finances in the uh, union, how what the bylaws uh, changes, proposed changes proposed are. And um, so, Lord, just bless us as uh, we share together and talk together. And uh, we pray that this would be a time that's very helpful to our delegates and uh, be worth their time with us tonight. So uh, bless us. And we uh, Thank you, Father, tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here's the here's some dates. I, again, you all know that the session is August 7th. Now, the day before, and we're going to give you an invitation right now, the day before is the dedication of our building, um, the NPUC office. It's about 15 years old, but we had a 20-year mortgage on it, but that's all been all paid off. It was paid off before the pandemic. Uh, in 2019, but then we hit the pandemic and never had an opportunity to celebrate. And uh, so we're going to have a time to celebrate now since everybody's in town. We thought that would be a good time to do that. Uh, that's the day before, but on the day of, 
we are going to have uh, registration begins at 8 a.m. and the um, session begins sharp at 9 a.m. We want to get that thing started immediately. Uh, the location is the Adventist Community Church of Vancouver, which is only 15 minutes, if that, from the union office. It's right uh, there in Vancouver. It's easy to get to off of St. John's Road. And uh, I know directions were sent to you, uh, and you can pull it up on any type of uh, device you have on the phone to help you find your way around. And... Um, Again, just an understanding that due to COVID, we've had to delay this session for one year. And what we're going to do is going to be reporting as if we had the session last year uh, on time, the reports were 2016 to 2020. That's a five-year uh, cycle. We're going to keep that the same so that we can continue to compare five-year cycles. And then this term that we're going to be going into is going to, we're going to vote a four-year term and get us back on the normal rotation, which is the year after General Conference. General Conference will be in 2025. Um, That's the next one coming up. And so our NPUC uh, session and constituency will be in 2026. And so it will be from 2021 to 2026. Uh, will be the next set of reports. It will be five years. And then, and if we keep it on a five-year cycle, then we can continue to compare uh, these cycles uh, and their um, apples to apples. So that's what we wanted to do. All right. And we'll be talking about that at the beginning of our session and get that uh, reporting uh, and, and uh, take a vote to make sure that uh, that happens. Um, <clears throat> The um, uh, nominating committee reports already been sent out to all of you as delegates. It's on our website also. And again, there's a lot of information on the website that I just want to call your attention to now. There's um, some uh, financial things on there for you, and there's all the bylaws. And uh, But here's the nominating committee report. We had a, a really good uh a nominating committee that was uh, chaired by our division president, Alex Bryant, and all three, uh, <clears throat> all of the three executive officers uh, were renominated back into their positions. Myself and Bill as the vice president for administration, Mark Rembold as chief financial officer. Uh, we all had evaluations done on us, and that was all shared at that time, and, and we were voted back in. The other uh, three that um, we have to vote on this time, this is brand new. Previous sessions, all we did was vote on the executive officers. Uh, but now we're going to be voting on the vice presidents um, uh, that we have. And um, Cesar De Leon for Hispanic Ministries, vice president, and Byron Doolin, vice president for regional ministries, have been renominated. And the only new name on there is for Keith uh, Hallam. And that is because our um, revered heavy, and much loved Dennis Plubel has decided that he'd rather be in that picture that he has uh, there, walking by the lakes in the mountains, than uh, uh, he's going to be retiring, is what's happening there. So uh, we're going to miss Dennis a lot. And um, but uh, we respect his uh, desire to retire. And Keith Hallam, who many of you know, uh, is uh, down at the Southern Union, holding the same position that Dennis held in our union, a little different title. And um, so that's been the vote to bring him back in. We had a search committee and uh, heavily involved were the education department, um, the other, uh, all the workers there in the education department, uh, Keith Waters and Becky Meharry and, uh, and um, well, even Dennis. And uh, so we, we talked that over. Uh, we had our ADCO team uh, take a look at some resumes, interview some people, and what they came out with was Keith Hallam as a as the name we took that into the nominating committee and they voted on that overwhelmingly 
Keith was the principal at, Ad, at uh, <clears throat> Auburn Adventist Academy and did a great job there. And we're going to be welcome him. We'll, we will welcome him back to the Pacific Northwest. He does know us pretty well. He was there for over 10 years. I think he was close to 15 years there and uh, yeah, 12 to 15. And um, so we're going to we're looking forward to having Keith back. Having that experience at the union level is going to help us have very uh, little disruption as we uh, move on with the work here in the North Pacific Union. All right. And uh, so, um, again, why um, are we having this meeting? Again, we're just trying to be proactive. Our time to, for any discussion is very limited at the session itself. So we hope we can answer some questions for you. We want delegates to have the opportunity to discuss things with us. Uh, transparency is important to us. Again, here's the uh, npc.org slash session is where you can pick up a lot of the um, inf extra information. And um, again, once more, no voting here tonight. Everything's already been done by committees. And the next voting on these things up or down is going to happen at the session itself. All right, so I think that covers just about everything for me. And um, we'll get into the financial report. And uh, But I will just take a moment to say, do you have any questions about anything that I shared here tonight? All right, I'm not seeing any. And uh, so I will... There's 102 of us online here tonight, and I think that's a great attendance. I was wondering if we were going to have 25. So to have uh, over 100 is awesome, and I appreciate the time that you're giving to us. We'll try to keep this thing moving. We, we respect your time that you're giving. All right, uh, Mark, I'll hand the baton to you, my friend. Okay, thanks, John. I really appreciate it. Um, let's see if I have control. Okay, great. Uh, for many of you, I, I see many of you I recognize on the uh, meeting tonight, and uh, some of you have heard some of this talk before, especially those on the executive committee, but then I see a lot of new people that perhaps is, this is a good opportunity to go over exactly what does the Treasury Department do at your union office. And so I'd like to just discuss a few of these areas and uh, have some slides for that. And so let's see if we can get this to work. All right, Mark, while you're working on that. Yeah, I, I just switched screens. I've got two screens here and all of a sudden it decided to wants to go to the secondary screen. Let me see if I can change which screen it displays on. I'm sorry, folks. That's okay. While you're doing that, let me answer a question that came up in the chat. Uh, is there a simple answer as to why only one VP is considered an officer? Um, we have in our constitution, we have three executive officers, and that's your president, your uh, vice president for administration, and your um, vice president for finances or your CFO, whatever title that we have for them. Um, so those are our three officers. It's in the constitution, and all of that is simple answer, Phyllis. It's just that's the way the constitution reads. They're all three officers, though. All right, we're gonna. I'm just gonna close my other monitor, which should force everything to one. And there we go. All hey, right. Sean, I don't know if you want to do a quick introduction to the guy that's talking and trying to steer this computer. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good idea. Mark Bonds. Mark, wait to us up there. Uh, and is our uh, interim, he's, he's actually saving us. I mean, he's, uh, he's come to us. We've had a change in the communication department. Uh, Jay Wintermeyer has moved on to some other things. And uh, Mark has uh, kindly consented to help us out with our communications needs. And, and you, you talk about a big need that we have right now with the session. And we are a really thankful for Mark's willingness to step in and help us. Well, we're, yeah, I think we ought to give him 
all of us here on the screen ought to give him a, a, a clap hands and just thank him a lot because he's really doing a great job for us and helping us get through this uh, time crunch for our session. And uh, then we'll have a full a full search. And if he uh, will, if he likes us, we we just may just go ahead and make an appointment. So uh, and that would be in October. And uh, we're hoping that he likes us a lot. So anyway, thank you, Mark. We appreciate you. Uh, Brother Renbolt, you may have uh, control of the screen now. Let's see if you can. Um, I guess. If Are you, you advancing that or am I doing that? I did. I did that one. Yeah, it's, it doesn't appear to be working on my end here. So I'll just have you do it, I guess. Let's just try, no, I'm, I'm try sharing more time. Here we go. And giving you <coughs> the uh, remote control. There we go. Now that should work, Mark. Let's see if that does it. Okay. What I really want to talk about tonight, as I mentioned, is for some of you in the executive committee, you've gone, we've gone over this, but I'd like to discuss exactly some of the roles of the Treasury Department. Within our department, we have five employees that we handle the revolving fund as well as the operations of the union. And I'd like to talk about seven key areas that are very integral to the financial administration. And we'll call those the general financial working policies of the church. And there's seven key areas that I have identified. And so we'll go over those one by one. The very first key area is the financial operations. And the very first thing that we want to always make sure that you realize is that we manage financial matters with integrity. It's very important that uh, we have this integrity and no, it's not working. There, it says you are now. Try it, try it. Yeah, you did that. And that we have our commitment to ethics, transparency, and accountability. It's very important that um, we be transparent in all accounting transactions. And I try to record all transactions so that we can clearly see what is happening and be able to report on a yearly basis, on a monthly basis, and then a yearly basis on those transactions. The other areas is that we try to promote and the most uh, design our systems to safeguard our resources within to support the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. With that, we use very good software the church has developed that handles nonprofit accounting. And for some of you, that's it's a very unique accounting is that we handle what we call restricted and non-restricted funding, as well as tithe and non-tithe. And we'll talk a little bit about that more within this discussion, but our software is able to handle that and promote it. We do follow, a lot of people ask this question, but we do follow general accepted accounting principles. So what we call GAAP, which is the standards in the accounting profession. And then we also follow the Federal Accounting Standards Board, and with that, the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, the financial area, sets forth accounting and reporting standards in conformity with both of these standards. And within the union office, we follow those very expressively, uh, the AICPA and FASB. The whole bulk of the uh, system is internal control. It's so important about internal control. Our environment, the actions, policies, procedures, it reflects our overall attitude of management, the directors and owners of the entity. And internal controls is very important. If we don't have internal controls, we do not have the transparency or the lack of adequate uh, recording process. It is our job in Treasury to identify and analyze the risk and we do that by preparing the financial statements and we can analyze each account and we can identify whether we need to make corrections or any adjustments throughout the year, what these are risk, risk assessments. We have control activities, our policies and procedures to meet the objectives. And uh, we, we do that very carefully, those control activities the very first thing we do within Treasury is that we make sure there's proper authorization. 
if somebody comes into treasury, let's say to wanting a check to be paid, we want to make sure that's within policy. There is proper authorization. Um, we will ask the department person for that. And then before it's paid, the uh, under treasurer will sign off on it. And then when I prepare financial statements, we will also look at the authorizations of all the transactions and make sure that they are duly noted and are correct. We wanna make sure there's adequate documentation and records. What's, what this means is that if we make a reimbursement, let's say for receipts, we wanna have all receipts in hand before reimbursements are made. And we do not make any reimbursements without the receipting process. So it's very important that we do have the documentation and records. We do keep physical control of our assets. We do keep an asset ledger, which is held within the association to record our depreciation and accumulated de depreciation. And that is important within the association, the physical assets. And then as I mentioned previous, we do have the independent checks and performances. And then uh, lastly, with these independent checks, right before the audits, right about in March, I will go through all transactions especially within checks written, and just double check to make sure that we all have proper signatures and that everything is in order for the audits. It's most important that we have information and communication when we initiate all these transactions, records and processes. And if we have any questions, I might have questions that I will talk with my fellow officers and we will actually talk about uh, payments or perhaps certain transactions that need to be done. Also, when there are expenditures above our limits, they do get authorized by the executive committee. When we go over, if we need to go over the limits of the officers, we go to the committee for those authorizations. So as you can see, there is an ongoing monitoring system. This is the most important part. The control environment is, if I could picture, if you could picture the umbrella, of the next four other components, it's the driving force, the controls within the treasury department. Without it, it's not effective and you are unlikely to get good results or a good audit without the good internal controls. And I am proud to say in the last five years, our office has done very well with the internal controls. And you'll see that a little later here. The very first thing we do within treasury really is a budgeting process. The budgeting process is, is mission-driven. There are goals, mission-driven ideas and projects that the officers and departments have created. And we use those projects. I use those projects in developing the process. The first thing I want to say is that the budget, you can design a budget two ways. One is top-down management dictates the budget. Another one is bottom up where we let the departmental directors create and have, give assistance to the budget. I do believe in the bottom up approach in budgeting into where all of our employees are involved in the budget. And uh, so this is the start of the budgeting process that we do each year. When we do our budgeting, the very first thing I look at is the major, mo major portion of our income our resources is tied. Um, I'm, it's kind of nice since I've been here since 2005, I have a track I have on record at my fingertips here, every tithe dollar given by every conference or church for the last 25 years by week and by month. And so it gives me a good, you can do some really good studies and ratios and analysis of tithe projections. And what I really look at is the past tithing from January, from let's say for the year of January to September. And then I might look at October and December of the prior year to get a 12 month projection of tithe. And then what we try to do when we set the budget is to use a percentage of that projected budget to set the budget. And we wanna use a percentage between 95% to 100%. In the last five years, we've tried to use about 97% of our anticipated tithe um, to be budgeted within our budget at 97%. And with that, as you can see for 2022, I just wanted to show is that 
we budgeted for $9.5 million of tithe that comes to the union, that's 9% of the portion. And then it was an increase, a tremendous increase from 2021. Once we project the tithing and the income, we do have budget assumptions. And these are budget, the very first budget assumptions have to do with our salary, remuneration, and the benefits. And these are just some of the uh, assumptions that are, we create, we look at, we study. As you can see, there's a slide here about eight different uh, areas, and it does take some time. We do look at a lot of charting. We do look at a lot of uh, state charts, uh, cost of living charts, and to develop the budgets and the remuneration plans. I just wanted to let you make a mention though, remuneration factors are increased at the North American division level yearly in November and always are set in July of the preceding year. The other big major budget assumption that we do is our evangelism. And I'm, I'm just excited that this union is very committed towards evangelism. There's a department that actually Bill McClendon does handle as our VP for administration very passionate about evangelism. And as you can see, these are some of the areas that we have set aside for evangelism to help the conferences in their evangelism budgets. And this is just a, a few of the areas that we do give for evangelism. And yet we still try to maintain a small bounce left over to continue for the next year. Along with budget assumptions, some of our major areas or functions is our K-12 program and also Walla Walla University. And so we try to, we do receive a large amount of funding from the North America Division, which is an allocate, which is an appropriation to us, but then we allocate that back down to the conferences. And in addition, I, I know that Dennis smiles at this because we're one of the few unions that do this. We also allocate 85 basis points of our tithe and it is non-tithe though, funding of $861,000 to the education program. And I'm proud that we are able to continue with that percentage compared to other unions. We started also at the beginning in 2016, it was a suggestion by the education department to start a Hispanic scholarship fund. To date, that fund has grown to where we are setting aside $200,000 in 2022 for Hispanic scholarships. Another large expenditure is for auditing. And um, a lot of you might not realize that the union office pays for 25% of all the audit costs for all the conferences and its senior academies. 25% the union pays for. And so we, we set aside about uh, a little under $300,000 for those auditing. The most interesting thing to note here is that over the last five years, our conferences have done such a great job in the treasury work with internal controls is that they have cut their hours down of budgeted auditing hours to where the cost is lower than budget. And, um, I know that John uh, Friedman, you can smile at that because you remember in past years, that was not always the case regarding auditing. Mm -hmm. And we always used to spend more for auditing, but now we are right on budget and spending less for auditing. Another area that we do budget for, we continue with our small conference assistance. We charge three larger conferences, that is Washington, Upper Columbia, and Oregon, 40 basis points of a fixed amount based on 2019 a tithe. And then we send that money to our two smaller conferences, which is Alaska and um, um, Montana Conference. You might say what's happened to Idaho. Idaho has grown so well is that they are no longer considered a small conference, but we will put them in a category of a mid-sized conference. So that's exciting. The other areas that we do try to keep up and maintain is our technology. And so we do always try to keep our equipment up to date. We amortize equipment between three to five years and uh, we keep our servers, computers and other equipment needs, like I say, up to date. And we spend roughly about $100,000 each year for that equipment. Hey, Mark, a quick question came in before you go. There was a $200 line item that you mentioned for scholarships. 
you labeled it Hispanic. Someone in the chat wanted to make sure or clarify, is that just for Hispanics or is that open to other groups as well? That is, uh, Dennis could come on, but it's, as my understanding, it's just for the Hispanic scholarships, correct? Thank you. Okay. Then we also have other budgeting things that we do talk about positions. I'm really happy to see this slide is that we do make uh, provisions for internships, not just for ministerial interns that go take the MDev program, but we have positions for business interns, communication interns, and summer business interns that we've been able to provide funding to our conferences. Uh, with that, we have the uh, pastor, women in pastoral ministry uh, that we do set some money aside for three women for that scholarship. And so I'm just happy that we're able to keep up the internship program. And then we also budget for some of our meetings that we've had, like general conference. There was a call of convention, I know, this year. And uh, our constituency session, we have set some money aside for the constituency session. So when we do the budgeting process, we put it all together. What's going on here? It's not. I then create a statement, a statement of changes of net assets. Some of you might know that as profit loss, but in the nonprofit world, we call that changes of net assets. We take our total income, our expenses that we budget for, and the, really the bottom line is, are we positive or negative? And as you can see in this budget for 2022, we end up with a positive budget of $157,000 positive that we should end with. And I'll just want to let you know right now is that for 2022, we are ahead of budget. So that's a good note to say. This is an interesting slide. The number three of our financial areas is that as far as possible, we refrain from any borrowing towards a bank or whatnot. We did make one provision. We did borrow some money for the office building. Back in 2007, we created a loan. It was mentioned by John earlier that this loan was to go for clear up to 2025. What's exciting was in 2018, you'll see, a, a, you'll see it on a slide, but in 2018, we put $500,000, executive committee voted to put $500,000 down against the loan. And in March of 2019, we were able to pay off the loan completely. And I can't wait till next week, we are going to burn a mortgage. And so because of that, we don't have any borrowing at this moment, so. I think all of you should be happy with that. <laughs> Financial reports is a major part of the position of the Treasury Department. It's all the reporting processes that we do. The executive committee and officers need to be kept fully informed concerning operations. Uh, my office prepares monthly financial statements showing actual operating expenses and budget against budget. And we do this, and because of that, then we can quickly, as officers and with the committee, we can increase income or decrease expenditures that might be necessary with those reporting processes. During this past quinquennium, monthly financial reports have been distributed to the executive committee officers and department directors. <clears throat> the frequency is greater than the core working policy, which says that it only needs to be distributed to the committee four times a year and to the officers nine times a year. But I'm happy to say that we have been able to provide it every month on time at the first of the month a financial report. In that report, the executive committee and management will see that uh, we list what tithe has been received for the past five years. And this is just a sample slide of tithe for, for the month of December only. We received, on this slide, we received roughly 13% of our tithe came in for the month of December. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite amazing when you think about that, uh, tithing for December, 15% of the total tithe for the whole year comes in for that one month. Along with that, then we also will show a slide of cumulative tithe year to date. This slide will show comparing 2020 to comparing to year 2019. 
In this example, we had 52 weeks in 220 and 52 weeks in 2019. Some years you might have an extra leap year, uh, leap, leap month, which you would have 53 weeks. So it's quite exciting to uh, see this a little bit. Um, our tithing, as you can see in 2020, we had a 5.84% increase in tithe over the prior year of 2019. I know some of our conferences do like to look at tithe per capita. So we do show this figure. And it is, you might say, well, it's quite low, the tithe per capita, but it's still probably one of the highest tithe per capita within the North America division. So the North Pacific Union does have a higher tithe per capita than other unions in this area. Uh, I noticed there was a question regarding revolving fund and we'll talk about that at the end of this report for operations. We'll just touch the revolving fund a little bit. So um, we'll get to that, okay? The year to date tithe you can see on a slide here. Um, tithe has increased tremendously over the five years. For 2016 to 2020, and that rose um, again by 21%. And I don't know about you, but that's pretty good when you think about a 21% increase from 220 to 216. That's an average of roughly 5% per year increase in tithe. One of my former treasurers here in this union and one of my best friends was Norman Clam. And he used to come around this office <coughs> and would say that cash is king. And uh, you know, he's right about that. Uh, if you have enough cash and investments or liquid assets, you can do a lot more within your mission and within your projects. And so as you can see, even despite COVID times, lowering of expenditures, but with good tithing, we were able to retain cash and investments of 6.2 million ending in De December, 2020. <coughs> so that has built up our reserves, which I'm gonna say is that then the executive committee in 2021 voted to create a scholarship program for Walla Walla University, uh, $1 million over four years and then Again, in 2022 of this year, we just voted another million dollars over four year program to come out of these reserves. And so that's quite exciting that we have a buildup of cash and investments that can help assist. Also, we did assist our conferences during COVID times with a special appropriation to each of our conferences. And that amounted to roughly a million dollars that we gave back to the conferences. We do look at an indicator, days of cash on hand. And this is always important to look at these indicators, um, the days of cash. I always like to say they need to be above 115 days. And as you can see, we're above that. I don't want it to go, sometimes conferences will go way above this. Um, I don't like to see it grow too, too much because it says that we're retaining a lot of reserves. I'd rather see this be at a constant level of about 120% and that we give money back down to Walla Walla University or to our conferences, those reserves. So we do watch our days of cash on hand very carefully. Another indicator as you can look at is our current ratio and our working capital. And um, the current ratio is our how, what is our obligation? Do we have enough? Do we have enough assets to um, to cover our obligations? Again, you would like to have this above a two to one ratio, and as you can see, we've done that except for 2018, and it dipped in 2018 because of our $500,000 expenditure to the mortgage. And then another uh, indicator that we use in the church is working capital. It is a formula based prior to 2021 or 2020 and prior years, we had a recommended working capital that we should be at least above 100% to be running the uh, office smoothly. And as you can see, we have met those objectives pretty much right near the 100% level for the five years. Other areas that we do look at is our salary, remuneration, and our benefits as it relates to gross tithe. 
you might see this now. This is a ratio that you do not want to compare to other entities, such as conferences or to universities or academies. Conferences, you'll have a higher ratio because of more pastors, more uh, employees, such as pastors and teachers. But we look at this internally is how well is our office running for the staffing needs? It has dropped a little bit in 2020. It's not because of our we lowered one FTE is because tithe increased in 2020 as shown previously. But this is a good ratio that we will want to continue looking at uh, throughout our um, reporting process. We do then throw together the uh, statement of net changes. And with that, we will, I will show the income. The very first slide is showing restricted income. And I just want to say when income comes restricted, either through an appropriation or through a donation, and it is restricted for a particular project or an event, we make sure that that's what the money is used for. And so it's held in a special accounting rules and then transferred out into non-restricted to when we expend it. So it's very important. And so as you can see, most of our restricted funds come into the form of appropriations from the North America division. We then look at our income side, our unrestricted income that comes in. We do have a slight investment earnings. Most of our investments are in, they are in, I should say, uh, short-term bonds. We want to be able to put those in short-term and in bonds so that we could create liquidity at a quick basis if we need that. And so the, you'll see our total income was slightly under $18 million for the year of 2020. We then look at our expenses. And our expenses are split up in two areas. We have our program services. These are for the services of the North Pacific Union, such as the church ministries, our educational functions, that includes Walla Walla University, a slight amount for our health area, and then our other departments. We have various departments throughout the union. And so we have our program's uh, expenses were $14.3 million. Excuse me, I went the wrong way there. Our other expenses were supporting services. And you can see here is that our supporting services include our administration, our retirement contributions. This is the defined benefit plan. Now, what I'm excited about this is that this is right now we pay between the conferences and the union, we're paying about 13% of tithe into this defined benefit plan. But the good news is, is in less than 15 years from now, this plan will be fully funded and there'll be no more payment going into the fund. And so when you think about that, that will be an additional $1.3 million more plus back into the hands of our local conferences and into the union. I'm excited about that. You'll see our offer office operations and maintenance. Our medical, we've gotten a pretty good handle of our medical costs. We've been keeping right in budget for the last five years. So we put our total income, less our expenses, our transfers between the various functions. We show here for the ending of 2020, a net change in assets, a gain of 976,000. And I'll be honest with you that I believe that's the highest uh, increase in net assets since I've been here since 2005. And it's, I'm, just, uh, I'm just amazed how the Lord has blessed us, even despite the beginning of COVID years. We did have contingencies to decrease our expenses, but we were able to come up. The Lord has blessed us immensely for that year. Amen. Other ratios that we show each month, I do uh, financial indicator ratios. Our committee receives a two-page report of all the different uh, indicators. And it's just good. To, it's a five-year comparison of indicators, as you can see. And real quickly, uh, a committee member or management can look at these indicators. If they come out of line, we can ask questions, ask what is the problem, and make adjustments if necessary. And like I say, this is performed every month by the Treasury Department, our key indicators. I'd like to talk with you now just a little bit about the report coming up on August the 7th. <coughs> As John mentioned, we do have a short time to present the full financial 
picture of the constituency report. But I wanted to show a few slides tonight just to show you of what some of the items that I will be presenting. And if you have questions tonight, we can just go through that. Like I mentioned, one of the very first things we do look at is the tithing. And again, you'll see how the tithe has increased for each year. Where in 2020, we ended up with a 5.84% increase. And we had an increase every year except for 2016 and 2019. And so we've been blessed with our tithe. And now what's really neat is that tithe exceeded the 100, 100 million mark. And uh, uh, 2005, we were at about 81 million. And I thought we'd never, somebody said, I think John Friedman, you were in Washington conference and you mentioned, will we ever get to 100 million? Well, it's during your time that we had reached the 100 million was in 2020. So it's kind of exciting. Mm. Amen. That kind of corresponds with the uh, membership. Uh, Bill could probably correspond that with our growth in membership, too. Um, this is an exciting chart. Uh, I know it's a little busy, but this shows each conference for five years, their tithing. And I'm just excited. Look at our, 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 our smaller conferences. Idaho Conference had an increase each year for five years in tithing. Alaska four years out of the five years of an increase. And Montana, three years with an increase. And that's just exciting to see uh, for our conferences. And then Oregon, Upper Columbia, Washington, few ups and downs, but they ended in 2020 with a wonderful tithe increase overall. And so this is a, just a wonderful chart to kind of look at regarding our conferences and tithing. A lot of people have asked me, um, this is just again a, a breakout of over the five years. This is, this is an um, amazing total. We received a little under $500 million in tithe in the five years. And I know that's a, that's a huge number. And you will see where that tithe came from, the percentages from each of the conferences. You will see a little small sliver in red uh, it's not even identified by a percentage. That's direct tithe to the NPUC. In 2016 and 2017, we would receive once in a while direct tithe directly to the union. In 2018, we changed our practice that we said that any tithe that comes into the union office, we will send it back to the conference completely, that the union will not keep any tithe that's sent to them directly. And that has worked well. We still keep that practice to this day. Our tithe for the last 25 years, this is this is amazing slide. You'll see the last 25 years, our practice tithe has increased for each quinquennium. Uh, the years from 1996 to 2010 increased over 20% in tithe increase. And then you can see the increase up to 484 million ending of 2020. A couple of weeks ago, I performed this chart. This is taking the uh, inflationary rate that's published by the US government. And I just wanted to compare it to actual current tithe that we receive. And I like this trend is that you'll see the inflation rate and our tithing patterns are above the inflationary rate. We have wonderful, faithful members. And what's really interesting to note, look at 2007 and 2008. Those are actually recession years, and yet tithe giving exceeded in those two years. So that's kind of an interesting uh, note to look at when we're comparing against the uh, CPI. Tithe distribution. A lot of you might ask, where does tithe go? And so I created this chart, our tithe distribution. For every dollar that is collected in tithe from our members, 64.6% .6 is retained by the local conference. And we'll go just around the circle here. The net tithe retained by the North Pacific Union, 90% is given to the union, but we retain 6.8% of that. 9.75% goes upwards to the North American Division, 5.85% to General Conference. The good note, good note about this is that the General Conference is reducing the amount of tithe that is to be sent up to them. 
For the last three years, they've reduced that amount by 25% each year. And I think they're gonna continue with that practice until it gets to roughly a 3% level. Mm. And then you'll see that 11.4 combined by the conferences in the union of uh, goes to the retirement to the DC DB program. And again, this is gonna be exciting in about 15 years, that slice will go away and we'll probably move into the larger, into the purple slice. And then you'll see a, a slight amount that the NPUC also remits to the retirement fund. This is a great chart to show. We, like I say, we mentioned a gross amount, 9% from each of the conferences and tithe. And you can just see how that amounts, amount, amounted to. And, um, it's kind of an interesting graph. We had an 8.4% increase from 2019 to 2020. The operations. There's a lot of ways to look at operations. We could look at net, the, the difference between appropriations received and expenditures. But for tonight, I just wanted to show our total expenses uh, that the union has paid out. Um, and so you will just show this real quick. The large uh, amount of this is the um, um, retirement's a large amount. Our education, yeah, our education is in here, our educational programs. There's our other programs, functions I mentioned, 14.54% and our supporting and then our percentages. And so this is a, Great breakdown of our expenses, which is on the uh, financial statements, just shown as a pie chart to each one of you. And uh, I think there was a question. Randy Maxwell had a question. And do you mind, Bill, if I just talk about that real quick? Sure. Okay. That's a, and thanks, Randy, for bringing this up. Since the general conference is lowering, lowering the portion or percentage of what's sent to them, where does it go to? It's going right back to... A small amount went, did go back at the initial years to the uh, division office, but most of it now is going directly to the local conference level. So I hope that helps out. The union is always at the 9%, but the conference is increased in the, uh, has increased in the amount retained, as well as a slight amount by the North, North, North America division. Thank you. This slide shows our bottom line, our increase and decrease of the net assets for each of the years. Like I mentioned, we had a good year of 2020. You look at that blue line in 2018, you'll see it. What happened in October was the 500,000 that we paid off for the office building or the, a major portion of the office building. And this is just a good graph of showing our increases and decreases of net assets. Overall, the increase for the five years was a little bit was a little over 1.2 million dollars overall for the five years, and that's just neat to see that increase for the five years. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned this: our expenses per day we've fairly stable, have not increased that much uh, at that level, and uh, despite the cost costs have gone up, we've fairly kept our expenses at a fairly level rate even though we've given some extra appropriations to our conferences and also paid off our mortgage. So that's just our chart of expenses per day. Mm -hmm. The other areas that the, uh, we do like to show is our days of cash, working capital, I've mentioned that. And one area is our liquid assets to commitments. Are we able to, do we have enough liquid assets to cover our current liabilities? And as you can see, if you were under 100%, you'd be in big trouble. And we're hovering right above of 150% for the five years. And so uh, that's a good ratio to look at. This is a good, important one to always look at is our liquid assets to our commitments. Right. With that, step six of what the Treasury Department does is that we prepare always for audits. You know, it's, it's um, now... A lot of you, I, I want to say this, is that we have on the website right now that you can open up under constituency session, we have 10 audit reports 
five are for the uh, operations and association and five reports for five years for the revolving fund. And I'll be honest, they're there, roughly about 75 pages in length with a portfolio. And if you have somnia or trouble getting to sleep, you might want to open those up and you might want to read them some night. <laughs> um, kind of interesting to read those reports, but at least you do have those reports that you can always have reference to. And uh, you could check my numbers sometime against those reports. But I just want to let you know they're under the constituency website. The audit is prepared by the General Conference Auditing Services. I do want to make a mention, even though it's General Conference Auditing Services, they do act independently, uh, 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 much like an independent entity of their own. That way they're not influenced, let's say, by a North American division or a General Conference or by us. They're completely independent and they audit using the general accepted auditing standards. And then they also audit the financial records, the transactions, as well as NAD working policy. And so they prepare a policy report as well as a financial report within that audit. And uh, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I think we have some of the best auditors of North American Division right here in the North Pacific. And so you will hear from Melissa Reynolds, head of the General Conference Auditing Team on August 7th, when she gives her report. On that report, they have an opinion of the financial statements that clearly states the financial statement that was audited and the responsibilities. And I just put down one of the opinions as internal auditors that they, they look for anything that's material or not material, and they want to present fairly uh, the statements in a good order according to FASB and how it relates to the uh, accounting principles generally accepted by the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. And I think they do a very good job at this, of the auditors that do this. Um, with that, we received a clean, unqualified opinion for all five years, 2016 to 220, in this quinquennial. And I'm just glad for that. Uh, they were completely clean and uh, unmodified. And I just appreciate that, uh, giving that report to the executive committee. There is a report to governance and to the executive committee, the, uh, a summary of the scope and material of the audit. There's a quick summary regarding the assets, liabilities, net assets. They have financial trends that they put in there that you could quickly look at, tithe income, net income, and working capital. They also check for our indicators, the ratios. They're very particular about working capital and where we stand. And at the end, they do give a audit opinion. And there is uh, four opinions. Uh, the worst that you can receive is a disclaimer, which means that you got major errors. There's a qualified audit, which means it's okay, but you have some problems. But the one that I like the most is the unqualified, unmodified opinion. And so that's the opinion that we have received <laughs> for five years. And uh, the auditor concludes that the overall financial statements are fairly presented. And also, this is important to note, within that audit, we met all the North America Division policy compliances, as well as keeping our insurance coverages up to date and per policy. And nothing was noted that was out of compliance with our insurance coverage for the five years. Another statement that was said in our audits, there was no material weaknesses that were noted. We did not propose any significant audit adjustments for the five years. There was no misstatements aggregated by us during the audit, which were not corrected. So if we did have an adjustment to be made, it was disclosed at the draft, we were able to correct it before the final audit was produced. With that, then there's communications with governance and there was no new accounting policies that were adopted and everything is spelled out that they did not know any transactions the organization, organization entered into during the year that were both significant and unusual. And that's always good to have that uh, noted. With that, there is a signed representation release letter that's always attached to the portfolio. 
and it's reviewed, signed, and dated by all three officers of the North Pacific Union. In fact, this last week, we just signed the audit uh, release letter for the 2021 audit. And again, that was very clean and unqualified and unmodified. With that, what, what happens next? Well, we do, we do have a financial oversight committee. We do have a audit finance committee that meets twice per year. And that meets either on the sometime in the first quarter of the year and on the fourth quarter of the year. And it's roughly about uh, seven members, uh, people, the lay people and committee members. Um, I wanna say our uh, executive committee members are on this yeah. committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, we go over the audit report. They are given a chance to ask questions to the auditors, even with management out of the room. And so I think that's a good process that is being handled well. In the beginning of the first quarter of the year, we do look at a compensation review committee. And that meets once per year, like I say, in March, and we review the remuneration and benefits of all the employees within this union. And both of these committees are chaired by Dale Galusha, who is the uh, president of the Pacific Publishing Press there in Napa, Idaho. So with that, um, that is my financial report, financial report tonight. I know I went over it fairly quickly, but I tried to do it in detail for you. And um, so with that, I don't, if you have any more questions, uh, John or Bill, or, if you, or Mark, if you want to monitor that, I'm happy to take any questions. I do want to say on the revolving fund, and that was, thank you for remind, reminding me of that. The revolving fund is still closed. We do not accept any deposits, new deposits into the revolving fund. Uh, the only way that we can keep this fund and get it open is if we get churches and schools to start borrowing money. I know that's kind of a, a toss up of, you know, we want to loan money out. If we can loan that money out, then we can open up the uh, revolving fund. But presently, it is a closed fund. And uh, that fund is paying right now on the de depositors, is paying 1.75% on the deposits. And for those that take out loans, it's 4.5% for a loan, which is still less than on today's market currently. So that's just what I want to say about the revolving fund. Okay. And John, I'll take that back to you or somebody. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, nice job with uh, the report. And I do not see any uh, questions here on chat, nor do I see any hands raised. And uh, I think we were giving people a chance to answer questions as they were going along. So okay. I think what we'll do is, Bill, I'm gonna, we'll hand you the baton and talk about uh, what's happened with the Constitution and Bylaws Committee. All right. Well, uh, now the exciting part. You know, we talk about all that money, and it it was a, it is a good report, and it Amen. continues to be a good report. Um, so, one of the other major things that happened during a constituency session is that as we come together, we consider uh, changes and uh, modifications to our bylaws. Our, our bylaws are our governing documents that tell us how we're gonna uh, work together as a group. Uh, more than a year before our uh, session meets, uh, our conferences um, uh, are allowed to uh, select members of our um, MPUC bylaws committee. Each conference gets a couple individuals to serve on that. And uh, these are the individuals that are currently serving. It's a standing committee that is already been appointed and they will continue until a new one has been selected for the next session. So we have representatives from all of our various conferences that serve on this committee. They've met many times. There's been many hours that has been spent um, to bring you the report that uh, you will be receiving at the session. Um, so I want to thank them for the, the great work that they've done and are continuing to do up until the session. 
As the committee has met together, uh, we've looked at three different areas of changes uh, that they would like to recommend uh, to the body. Uh, the first set of changes ha has to do with virtual meetings and then some miscellaneous editorial changes. Um, we're finding the way the church does business and how we do meetings has changed with um, uh, teleconferencing as well as video conferencing and it's time that we catch our uh, bylaws up to some of the practices that are taking place. So that's the first set. Um, the second the second set of, uh, well, let me back up here. The second set of changes that we are recommending to uh, the body has to do with uh, the nominating committee and its role in how it relates to midterm evaluations. And I'll unpack that in just a moment. But it, it does seek to clarify um, the role of the nominating committee uh, as it relates to officer evaluations. And then the third set that uh, is being recommended to us has to do with diversity and equity provisions and specific considerations for the executive committee members, as well as, and this is incorrect, this should be officers, not just executive officers. There was a question earlier about uh, the VPs and, and officers and whatever. So just, just to be clear, the way our bylaws uh, state, we have executive officers and then we have officers. So the executive officers as Elder Friedman shared earlier are the three, the president, the vice president for administration or what could be termed as the secretary and then the vice president for finance or the chief financial officer. Those are the executive officers. We have three other vice presidents that are considered officers. And uh, the, the changes that are being recommended have to do with all of our officers, not just the, the three. So I'll take a little bit of time and we'll just start here at the beginning uh, with the, the recommendations having to do with virtual meetings. And here's the summary that's taken for the most part from the rationale that has been provided to you as delegates. Um, there's some language in there about the ability to postpone a constituency meeting in the event of exceptional circumstances. Uh, I think we all know why that one's there. Uh, flexibility to the way MPUC leadership may notify of constituency uh, sessions. As things have changed, um, we're finding that the, the meeting notification needs to be changed as well, and we'll unpack that in just a moment. Uh, it authorizes a virtual constituency meeting by electronic means. The bylaws committee kind of went uh, back and forth. Do we want to provide for, uh, in case we cannot physically meet together, uh, a constituency session that could be done by electronic means. And, and they decided that they did wanna do that. And so there will be language that we'll be looking at for that. Uh, it ensures that each nominating committee will serve until a new one is appointed. And you'll see what I mean by that. And that same change is gonna be recommended for the bylaws committee. Um, there, there's not a particular date. We, we don't impanel a nominating committee or have a bylaws committee until every conference has gone through the process to recommend people uh, for appointment to this committee. And you'll see the change that's going to be uh, recommended there. Um, allows the constituency materials to be sent in physical or digital formats. The language is vague. And, and actually this year we chose not to send all of the financial statements. As Mark said, there's a dozen or more, close to a dozen reports out there. They're uh, many, many pages long. That one inch binder that you received, if we had printed and included all of those, it would have been a three inch binder and it would have been even tough to fit it in into that. Additional changes include a, a clarification of one vote for each delegate is actually one vote for each measure that's gonna be presented for decision. 
Uh, a lot of these uh, recommendations are coming to you from the model constitution that every year the North American Division Executive Committee votes changes to the model bylaws. Um, it adds language regarding votes cast by electronic means. Since we're introducing the idea of uh, virtual meetings, we wanted to make sure that electronic votes carry the same weight as an in-person vote. Uh, and then there's some uh, additional clarification uh, in dealing with the executive committee that's empowered to discipline or terminate officers. It, it did not have anything about for cause, and that has been added. It adds language to allow for the virtual meetings of the, the executive committee. So earlier it was this, the constituency session. We also are including language in there for executive committees that can be convened by Zoom or some other electronic means. And then it clarifies the quorum requirements for the executive committee that we'll look at in just a moment. And then it adds a new definition of present or presence. We have a glossary at the back of the bylaws and uh, we've, we've clarified that to be present doesn't mean that you need to be in person on site if it is a virtual uh, meeting. It adds definition regarding for cause that we're adding that executive committee can terminate an officer uh, but it has to be for cause. And we pick up that language from the model bylaws of what that for cause could, could entail. So Mark, if Mark Bond, if you can uh, help me, we're gonna pivot. That was a summary of the changes. And uh, very quickly, we wanna look at the documents that were sent to you. Um, there were three sets of bylaws. Uh, we're calling them set A, B, and C. And at the bottom of each one, uh, you'll see a, 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 foot, a footer that tells you what version uh, that you're in. So starting here on the first change that we're recommending, Mark, can you click first? There it is. So this is the change. Uh, that's being recommended. Let me explain a little bit about how the changes are, are notated in the document. Anything that's written in blue that is underlined is proposed new language. Anything that is red that has a strike through is a language that's going to be removed. So from the reading of this, you can, you can see what the original wording is. It's in black. Anything in blue underline is add, red with a strike through is removal. So, so the first change that we see in the document is this language starting in 154 that has to do with being able to postpone the session. If you look at the model uh, bylaws from the North American Division, uh, this is almost verbatim. There's, there's a few tweaks that we've made, but it generally says that we can postpone a meeting for up to one year. And then when we do have that meeting, that the constituents can vote to go back on to the regular five-year cycle. So that's, that's the first change. The second change is also on this uh, same page that you're looking at, and it has to do with the notice of the meeting. The, the model bylaws only require one notice. In our document, it has said that there would be two. You can read it there in red, Notice of the time and place of any constituency meeting shall be printed in at least two consecutive issues of the official publication of the union, which is the Gleaner. Uh, the, the challenge that we're running into, the Gleaner has now become not a monthly publication, but a bi-monthly. Uh, and uh, with, the, uh, with the deadline to get something in a printed issue delivered to the home, it's often four or five or even six weeks before um, uh, it would go to press or, or actually be delivered in the home. It, it makes it very difficult to be able to convene a meeting that might be needed. So the committee is recommending that we just go to one issue. Uh, so the notice of the time and place of the constituency meeting shall be given by and then in A, a notice printed in the official publication of the union at least four weeks before the date of the constituency meeting 
or a method approved by the executive committee provided all constituents organizations uh, receive notice with sufficient time to select delegates. Again, this is language that's straight out of the model constitution and they're bringing that to us uh, as a recommendation. We don't know what the publication schedule will be for the Gleaner. There might come a time when we change it again and we did not feel that we needed to have two consecutive notices. So Mark, if you could take us to the next change. Uh, that's the same one. Those two are on the same page. So there's number three. This one is we've added a section uh, entitled virtual constituency meetings. It simply says the executive committee may authorize that a regular or specially called constituency meeting convened by means of elect electronic conference by which all attendees can hear each other at the same time and participate in the proceedings. So the recommendation is that we add that particular paragraph. Um, go ahead, Mark, click the next one. Uh, this has to do uh, with the nominating committee. Um, and this, this, this change is also being recommended for the bylaws committee. And we're just cleaning up the language. It used to be that the nominating committee would serve until, and you can look on line 241, at least 90 days prior to, to the session and shall serve until 90 days prior to the next one. We're removing that language and saying that the nominating committee will serve until a new one is appointed. That way we don't have any problems with overlapping committees. We don't have two committees serving at the same time because we don't meet that 90 day requirement. Uh, Mark, if you'll take us to the next one. This is the change for the articles and bylaws that, that pattern uh, the nominating committee, that the articles and bylaws committee will serve until a new one is selected. All right, well, let's go to the next one. This one simply gives us the authority within the bylaws that we can send uh, session materials to the delegates in either a physical or digital format. Next one. This is a, under section nine, you'll see uh, there's some change there that all delegates must be present. And then it says, as defined in Article 18, we'll get to that, but we have a new definition of present because it had the language in person at any constituency meeting that we're recommending a, a strike through because you can be present by electronic means. The, the next one is also on the same page. It's under Section 10, dealing with the voting rights of the delegates. And it just clarifies that you don't get just one vote at a constituency session. As a delegate, you're entitled to one vote for every measure or every question that will be voted on by the body. And then there's some language at the end of that to just make sure that, that votes that are cast by delegates electronically will have the same validity as if the delegates cast their votes in person. Um, I think that is the same one, right. Mark, if you can go to, to the next one. This is the change that's being recommended where we add on line 540 and 541, the phrase for cause, that the executive committee is empowered uh, to discipline and terminate an officer. It used to just have a period there but the committee is recommending that we add the phrase for cause. Then uh, the next one, this is still in a section entitled the executive committee. There is a clarification on B uh, because we wanted to make, uh, to authorize the executive committee to be able to either convene in person by telephone, by Zoom, however. And so this, additional statement 
that special meetings of the executive committee may be called at any time or place and by any means or by whatever means by the president or in his absence, the executive vice president. Uh, in 555, there's additional language generally, regular, regular and special meetings of the executive committee are held in person and on site. However, the executive committee may convene by means of electronic conference or similar communication by which all persons can hear each other at the same time and participate in the proceedings. And then again, votes cast by electronic means will have the same validity as votes cast in person. The clarification under the quorum, again, this is language that we see in the model. And all, all, all it is attempting to do is to clarify that you can't have a majority of the executive committee out in the parking lot of a church and it's a legitimate meeting. It has to be a majority of the executive committee under the chairmanship of the ranking officer or the president of the North American division will constitute a quorum in a duly called meeting. Here is at the end of the uh, bylaws as we get into an article 18 where the definitions and we've added on line eight, 837 and eight, the definition of present or presence to include by electronic means. And then there's one last uh, change that has, has to do with the definition of cause. And so termination for cause relating to the removal of an elected or appointed position or from employment. This term shall include, but not be limited to incompetence, persistent failure to cooperate with duly constituted authority in substantive matters and in relevant employment and denominational policies. Three actions, which may be the subject of discipline under the Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual. Four, failure to maintain regular standing as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Five, theft or embezzlement. Or six, conviction of or guilty plea in a crime. And again, that's language that's pulled directly out of the model constitution or the model bylaws. Uh, Bill, Bill, there is a question on the chat about uh, for cause. Does that allow an appeal process of some kind? All actions, and, and you could probably speak to this as chair, I believe all actions by an executive committee are appealable. Is that the right word? Can be appealed yeah, can be to appealed. a higher organization. Right. In our case, it would be up to the division. But yes, there would be a process for that. Are there any other questions in relationship to set A? All right. Uh, I think these are pretty straightforward. It, it's not radically changing much other than having the ability to do virtual uh, uh, constituency sessions. And then authorizing what's really kind of already happening is some of our committees have already started to incorporate electronic means of uh, convening right. committees and groups together. That's right. Hey, Bill, this is uh, this is Lou Fitting. I do have a question on on your um, second that you just presented. So um, uh, uh, I didn't notice. Is there? Is there definition or stipulation as far as when electronic votes will be accepted? For instance, if it is, if there is no pandemic or anything like that, and it is an on-site uh, session, um, will will all votes will uh, if someone was remote and wanted to send in their vote by email or something like that electronically? Uh, is there stipulation in, in some of the guidelines that that won't be accepted? They need to be present um, or again, will there also be blended meetings where we will allow people to attend virtually as well as on site? Um, just wanted some clarification on that. Good question. And, and the committee did spend some time in thinking through, do we want to be able to offer a, 
um, a hybrid, we'll call it a hybrid, where we have some in-person individuals and then some that are remote connected through Zoom or some other means. And it was, it was felt that in order for a meeting to really be conducted fairly with full representation and transparency, that, that all members of either the committee or the um, uh, session, the delegates, um, would need to be either all remote or all in present. And so currently the, the document, the way it reads is that the executive committee has the power to determine whether or not this session is gonna be by electronic means or in person, but we're not gonna try to figure out how to do how to do both at the same time. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure there was wording that I didn't recall that as we were going through it. But yeah, as long as that wording is there, that that's what I wanted to make sure that people understood that um, it's there's not going to be a hybrid and it's either all electronic or all in present press, you know, in uh, have to be present physically. Yeah, we actually did it in a in kind of a very small scale, um, a smaller group because Alaska, we tried to do that with their session where we had some delegates coming in remotely and, and it's just challenging. It's challenging in the discussion. It's challenging on being secret ballots and votes and all of that. And so our, our the, the committee felt it would be best to either, either, it's either all in person or all remote. Yeah. All right. Any other? Any yeah. other? Bill, um, the the technology isn't here yet, Lou, and and that will come down the road. I don't know, five years or so or so far. But uh, even on our Adventist Health uh, Board, we can't do a hybrid. It's it's uh, the technology is not readily available yet for that. Oh yeah, I, I agree. I just wanted to make sure that the wording and and like I said, I didn't see the that clarified, but I just wanted to make sure that the wording was stated very clearly so people understood that there was no hybrid opportunity at this point. It's one or the other. Right. And and Dave Thomas, Bill. Dave, how are you, friend? I'm well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question under the for cause uh, uh, section. Uh, it just says for a crime. It doesn't define what that means. There are many different kinds of crimes. Some of them are minor, some of them are very major. And I'm hoping this doesn't mean that if you get a speeding ticket, you get dismissed. <laughs> I'm just wondering about that word crime. Um, it's a good question because I brought up speeding too. But as I understand, uh, and I, so I'm probably going to get schooled on this, that violation of a traffic ordinance is, is, is not considered a crime at least, again, somebody's going to school me on that, I'm sure. That, that is, if, if you look at the model uh, bylaws, that is the language. And it's also, I think, in our church manual. So we deferred to the greater wisdom of a higher organization on this one. Um, but a, again, I don't think it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary that a person be removed if, you know, for any particular, it's just, they can be removed for cause. And um, so I don't know how else to answer that other than the fact that we, we use the same language that is in the model. Okay, thank you. And I, I know that the church officers are not noted for having a high crime rate. So this may not be a big uh, concern, but I just <laughs> wondered about it. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Bill, I had a question. Uh, the idea of virtual meetings is only for exceptional cases, right? I mean, we're not talking about trying to eliminate in-person meetings, right? So whenever in-person meetings can be held, that would be the preferred way to do it. And virtual meetings would only be in an exception. Well, for constituency session, that's true. But for instance, our bylaws committees have, have met over this past year have met, I don't even know how many times, and think about how efficient Zoom is when we're flying people in from Alaska and Montana and, and other places. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it, it kind of depends on the meeting. Constituency sessions, absolutely. In-person is preferred, and there would have to be a strong reason not to have it. 
but for other committees, it just makes sense that sometimes that's a more efficient way to do it. Thank you. Okay, I don't see, I, you know, Mark, help me out if there's anything else that's hanging or questions that have been unanswered. Are we good to go on? I think so. And <clears throat> would we go on to this set B section here? Yes. These, these are much uh, more narrow uh, changes. Uh, the, the set B has to do with uh, clarification of the nominating committee. I want to start with a statement that is going and bring up all the bullets, uh, Mark, get to the end of the slide. There is a nominating committee that's defined and um, are, you know, it, it articulates within the bylaws exactly what their function is. And the purpose of the nominating committee is to recommend officers to the session. As Elder Friedman shared the nominating committee report, those were uh, nominations that are gonna be placed in front of the delegates for consideration. And that's the purpose of the nominating committee. They recommend officers to the session. And then in between sessions, they are empowered to do the same. Uh, actually, they are empowered along with the, well, the nominating committee is 15 individuals plus about 40 of the executive committee in between sessions. So it is a very large group of people. And in between sessions, they're empowered to fill the vacancies that might occur. But that's their role, is to recommend and to fill positions. The Hit the next line there, Mark. Uh, the executive committee in our document is empowered with the authority to discipline and terminate officers. And if we vote this for cause. So the executive committee does oversight, it disciplines, terminates, things like that. The nominating committee doesn't do that. So there was some confusing language in the, in the current document that we have over the role of the nominating committee and their involvement in what is specifically the midterm evaluation. There had been a lot of work done on the bylaws at the, 2015, or the 2015 um, MPUC session. And um, for the most part, it's worked really well. We've, we haven't had any issues. But this is the first time when we've really lived with this document. And as, it, as we started to do the midterms, we saw some confusing language that we wanted to clarify and hopefully get the, get the delegates to consider changes that we think will make it better. So it authorizes the nominating committee to be called at any time. It ensures the nominating committee will have access to officer performance evaluation, specifically in the context of recommending uh, officers for positions. And then uh, it clarifies that the midterm officer performance evaluations uh, are to re be reviewed only by the executive committee because they're the ones that have the empower are empowered to discipline and terminate. So uh, Mark, if we could go to the um bylaws this would be if you're if you have your documents this is the one that's footnoted version b and it's really only a few uh changes and let me make one more comment about the notation on version b you'll notice there's some grayed out area uh, if you look at line 241 that's on your screen even though it's blue and, and a red strikeout, that has anything that's grayed out like that has to do with the prior version. So we've included the changes in the prior version, but we grayed them out so it wouldn't be quite so confusing. Um, so the first, uh, the first change that would be recommended is again, dealing with the nominating committee. It says that the, that the nominating committee shall and then, uh, Mark, if you could scroll a little bit uh, further, because we're recommending that that language in red be stricken, that the nominating committee shall meet when called at any time. And then it says that it's the, the president of the North American Division or his designee who is the chair. 
a written request and all of that language were not uh, changing. But so the nominating committee, number one, they meet when called by uh, the, the chair. Number two, they review formal officer uh, performance evaluations and recommend names of individuals for election of the officers of this union. Nomination shall be sent to all delegates at least one month prior to a regular or special constituency meeting which considers the selection, discipline, or termination of officers. Keep that in mind. This is a constituency meeting that is going to discipline or terminate an officer, not um, in between sessions. That paragraph two uh, is actually, Mark, if you'll back up, that all of that strikeout that we have, uh, keep going on the previous page, most of that new language is in that stricken. So line 251 to 254, much of that has been moved below in the blue language um, uh, below that. So Mark, if you'll advance. I don't know if I made sense there, but that, that subsection one has been moved to two right there. Then we're recommending that, the, again, the nominating committee, because they don't really have oversight, um, that item three be removed to review officer formal evaluations, which are done in accordance with Article 9, Section 4, Paragraph B, that references midterms. That's what we're really talking about. It's the midterm evaluation that the nominating committee would not uh, relate to in any way. And so we renumber that. So that the, those are the recommendations that we have in that area. Mark, I think there's uh, one other area. Um, I think it's the third one, yeah. If you can click the third one. And so this was the confusing language. Um, it says under the officer evaluations, it says that the executive committee under the chairmanship of the president of the North American division or his designee, less the officers of this union shall meet not, not less than once every half term of office as defined in article 18 to coincide with regular constituency meetings specifically to do a formal evalu a performance evaluation of the officers. Then it says this, this evaluation will be reported to the nominating committee. And there was a period. And it, and it didn't, it, it's very clear in this paragraph, it's the executive committee under the chair of the NAD president that meets to do this, but then it says it would be reported. And it was kind of confusing what that meant. It didn't seem to indicate that they were to meet with them but yet they were to somehow receive a report. And so that standing nominating committee at midterm is not the same nominating committee that will serve the session next time because prior to the session, a new nominating committee is selected. And so what, what this, these changes uh, entail is that that midterm evaluation would be available to the next nominating committee that would be serving to recommend officers to the following session. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there and just see what questions you might um, have at that point. No questions? Uh, David Prest, uh, Bill. David. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, John and Bill. Uh, just a clarification. <clears throat> uh, it may be that you're going to get to this. So forgive me if it's premature. But um, the nominating committee that met the end of June was a combination of the executive committee and nominating committee together. Does this document indicate that that practice will continue? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are not changing that. 
Okay. Um, the nominating committee is always uh, in in this document, the executive committee less the officers, plus an additional 15 people that are apportioned out to our conferences that every year select those individuals to serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill, do we need to slide down to this next section of changes or go back over to the uh, PowerPoint? Well, uh, the last one has to do, if you click on that last link, I, this, this is I, all grayed I, out. This is These are the grayed out ones of the previous ones. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Bill, there's a hand up with a question, Clinton uh, Meharry. Yeah, this was in relationship to something that was a little bit surprising, the, the constituency meeting having the authority to discipline. Um, I, I didn't think of the constituency meeting have that, that authority. I thought it was the executive committee. Can you clarify? Well, you are correct. The, the, the bylaws indicate that the executive committee is empowered to terminate and discipline. But that language uh, pre-existed in the document that apparently the executive committee can choose to call a special constituency session to deal with that issue rather than doing it themselves. Okay. But, but, they, but you're right, they are empowered to do it um, as the executive committee, because the executive committee are those that have been in, entrusted to do the work of the delegates in between sessions. Okay, thank you. Good question. Anyone, any other questions in relationship to that? Here, here's, here's what we're trying to avoid. If we don't change this, then what happens at the midterm evaluation um, when we do this, um, the North American Division conducts the evaluations, and then they set up a time to meet with our executive committee, less the executive officers, and, and we've done that. Um, so we have about 42 people on our executive committee that review that, but this document requires, if we, I mean, if we read it the way it kind of implies, even though it's a little ambiguous, the nominating committee would have to be brought in for that midterm evaluation to hear or get reported to uh, is the language it uses. So, so they come in and they participate in the midterm. And let's say if there was something that the committee, the executive committee felt like they needed to act on in discipline, the nominating committee members would have to be excused because that's not their role. They're not empowered to do that. And so this is typically a, a, a couple of hours, three hour meeting, and to fly 15 people in from across our union to sit in a meeting where they're not empowered. And oh, by the way, by the time new officers are selected, it'll be a different nominating committee because uh, you know one is selected prior to the beginning of a new session. So it, we're just trying to clean that up and keep, uh, keep the nominating committee within the lane that's been defined to recommend positions uh, for either reappointment or vacancies and the executive committee uh, to make clear that they have oversight. So I hope that helps. Our third set of changes um, that, that the um, bylaws committee is recommending to the delegates has to do with diversity and equity uh, and inclusion, specifically in the area of executive committee members and officers. So you'll see the summary of changes, it deals with appointments to the nominating committee be made with consideration to diversity of gender, age, race, and ethnicity. Um, second one there, it requires consideration to be given to women and to persons of ethnic and racial minorities in the selection of executive officers. And again, that, that, that is, it shouldn't be executive, it should just be officers, I'll, we'll get that corrected. And then third, appointments to the executive committee um, that are actually made uh, by the various conferences 
be made with consideration to diversity of gender, age, race, and ethnicity. So Mark, if you could get us over to the PDF document, we'll look at how that, what that language looks like. And so this is in a section uh, dealing with the nominating committee and it just says a point four we're adding or a paragraph four appointments to the nominating committee shall include consideration of diversity in gender, age, race, and ethnicity. Then the next, uh, the next one there has to do with the selection uh, of uh, officers. And so this is um, the language that's being recommended um, that in the case, and this is under the section of the nominating committee, um, that in the case where there is no incumbent, now the, the, the practice within the denomination and really at every level from a local school board that considers rehiring teachers every year all the, all the way through our system is that consideration be given to the incumbent first and you vote to return or not to return before you just open up nominations for, for anyone. And so there's that clarifying language in the case where there's no incumbent, the nominating committee shall consider at least one woman and one ethnic or racial minority person for each position except, and then there's this exception in I or one being the office of president. The nominating committee shall consider at least one ethnic or racial minority person in the event that the ordination of women is approved by this union, then this exception will no longer apply. So right now, because uh, our union does not uh, recognize the ordination of women, the, the, one of the requirements is that the president of a union be an ordained minister. Um, this is there um, uh, to treat the office of president different than secretary, treasurer, or the other vice presidents. And then I think there's one other uh, change, and that has to do with the executive committee uh, members. Mark, if you click on that third one. Appointments uh, to the executive committee shall include consideration of diversity and gender age, race, and ethnicity. So that, that is the proposed changes for uh, set C. And we'll entertain any questions that you would have about that at this point. All right, I think we wore them out. Um, <clears throat> Bill, you wanna go over um, the uh, voting on that, that these are two thirds, uh, the constitution has to be, uh, there are gonna be three sections that we'll vote on and right. to be approved, it has to be approved by three quarters or, or two thirds rather, right. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, one of the dangers that we always run into and it, and, it, and it gets to be challenging with 400 people in the room trying to agree on the language of anything. And so that's one of the reasons why we put them in packages um, and the hope is that we can kind of vote things up or down on the merits of the changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am sure there are always better ways to state things, um, but we run into trouble when we start trying to edit things on the floor of a meeting. And so um, uh, Elder Freeman's correct to, for any of these changes to take effect, it would, it would be a majority, a super majority or what we consider two thirds. Um, and so that is what we will present to the, to the session. So we will do each package separately, hopefully, kind of look at them as a whole, because obviously like, you know, in this first one, we can't vote pieces of it and, and not vote other pieces. If we vote virtual meetings, but we don't, meet, don't vote the idea that you can be present virtually. So they kind of all go together and, um, you know, we've, we've, we feel like the, the, really all of these 
there's been sufficient time to really spend time vetting these, considering them, pondering these. Uh, many of the changes that are in this first package are just straight out of the uh, model constitution. So we're, ho we're hoping that it won't create a lot of current controversy, but you never know. <laughs> All right, uh, Bob, I see your hand up. Go ahead. What What are you referring to as a model constitution? Where does that come from? That comes from the North American Division Working Policy. Uh, there is a model constitution for unions, conferences, um, and every year we consider changes to those. And so it's a boilerplate, a template, if you will, of, of uh, language that uh, provides consistency throughout um, our governance structure. And so there is language that we often will look to in, in particular areas that, that we'll find in all, I, I mean, we, the North American division would say that the model constitution in there are certain parts of it that are, they, they strongly recommend that we adopt without changes. And then there is other types that is free for a local entity to change as they feel needed. But in these areas where we felt like change was needed, we wanted to rely on, on kind of proven vetted language. And so that's what we did. We went to the model. <coughs> okay, so yeah. does that mean then that we will vote on each one of these one at a time? Each one of these three. Yes. We will okay. vote. We will vote each set. We'll we'll discuss each set separately. But but you'll vote one in, and then you'll vote in the next one if you want that one, and then you'll vote in the next one. Right. Or we'll vote none of them if they don't want to <laughs> eat any of them. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think Bill, there was something in the chat here um, about who puts together the model documents. You sort of uh, answered that. John, you might be able to speak to that, but I know the secretariat, there's a whole line of secretariat. There's many, many committees that look at this. I know um, at year end meetings or, or periodically, I've, I'm part of a secretariat council of other union secretaries that review these. And then there is a group called NADUP that uh, considers that. That's all of the union presidents, well, all of the union officers of all nine unions and other vice presidents. So it's a group of about 75, 80, John, would that yeah. be? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they, then they, they review it and vote it. And then it goes to the North American Division Executive Committee that I think is close to 300 people that will vote it. And once that's voted, then it goes into what we call the red book, which it has all the other policies of the North American division. Yeah, and the only thing I'd add to that bill is that there are uh, attorneys that are looking at everything that, that we do and just to make sure the language is right, so. All right, I hope that answered um, Joe's question. Any other questions for us? All right, I don't see any right now, but uh, I am grateful that you all have given us your time tonight, a couple of hours of your time, which we uh, don't take for granted. We pray that it was uh, good for you to hear all of this and it gives you a kind of a head start as we get to the, uh, to the session. And uh, so again, just remember, you're all invited out to the, the day before to the dedication of the uh, building. We're going to have the mayor of Ridgefield and some representatives from the fire department down the street and, and uh, all of our officers from the NAD are going to be there. And uh, so I and we're going to and we're going to we're going to throw in a free dinner. Yeah, that's right. We're going to feed you, too. So, um, hey, can't get any better than that. Uh, except the fact that we're doing the cooking and I'm not sure how you like that, but you, it'll, uh, I think it'll still be okay. All right. So um, anyway, it'll be a good time and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the, the weekend and, uh, and seeing everybody. You know, we, a lot of us haven't seen each other for a long time. Um, 
face to face. And uh, we don't want this to be a spreader event. So if you feel comfortable and you uh, want to wear a mask, feel free to do that. Uh, we want to make it as safe as possible. We're going to try to spread people out. Um, but, uh, you know, just just understand you got to take precautions because it's still, uh, you know, COVID's still out there. I'm just recovering from it myself. I've been out at a number of camp meetings and uh, and just getting over. I picked up something somewhere, either on the airplane, a, a um, uh, airport or, or at uh, someplace, one meeting. Uh, here's a uh, gene. I asked the spouses for dinner. Yes, if you bring your spouse with you, they can have dinner, too. And um, we may add more water to the soup if we uh, get too many. But uh, we did ask for you, if you are coming, please let us know. There's a place to, um, in the institutions, that's right, to let us know that you're coming and if you might bring somebody else with you. All right. I think that kind of does it. I thank uh, uh, Mark Rembolt and Bill McClendon for their presentations. I appreciate what you've done there. Um, I'm thankful for Mark Bond, who uh, is helping us and uh, done a great job tonight helping us uh, walk us through. And uh, um, I'm who was doing um, huh, our, our associate in, in communications? Anthony. 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 I'm sorry. I did. Your name just went blank for a second. But uh, Anthony, that's called COVID fog. Yeah, it is. That's true. And I've got lots of it right now. So uh, Anthony has uh, been uh, running our uh, some of our meeting here tonight, recording everything and has us on um, on what was it? YouTube, Mark? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thanks for everybody for being here. Lord bless you. And let me just uh, close with prayer and then we'll and we'll officially let you go. Father in heaven, we uh, are indeed grateful <clears throat> for the time that you've given us tonight, uh, for the blessings that you've given to this union. We've been blessed financially. We've been blessed, uh, Lord, uh, with our schools, um, blessed with a wonderful university, blessed with great churches that are reaching out to their communities. And even in the midst of uh, COVID, the ministry has not stopped. And uh, so, Lord, we have lots to praise you for. And we are very grateful and we pray for a good celebration as we look over the last uh, five years uh, that you've given to us and uh, look forward, Lord, to uh, the next four. So bless us uh, together as we, uh, as we do this meeting and keep us safe, Lord, uh, from uh, all this COVID stuff. Keep everyone safe as they travel. And Lord, again, let's just let this be a time where friends are able to be together and uh, to praise your name and to celebrate together. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Take care.